This is a block of acrylic. And now, it's a Lichtenberg figure. And so is this. And also, this. And of course, we can't forget about all these. And so, what are these things? How do we make them? And what can we use them for? Well, the most obvious use case is making the most beautiful desk ornaments known to man, objectively. And perhaps even the best table decorations, again, objectively, of course. Also, probably the coolest Morse code beacon in the world. And of course, they can be used to get lost. Lost in the intricate, fern-like dendrites that seem to just go on and on and branch into smaller and smaller channels where every glance of the eye brings you to a completely unique pattern. But while our primary use case for Lichtenberg figures is decor and art, the formation of Lichtenberg figures and the mechanisms by which they do so is a topic of active research where the formation of Lichtenberg figures in a variety of materials is studied. Materials such as air, insulative materials like the acrylic we have, or even skin. So while we have a very large appreciation for the beauty of these figures, we may have an even larger appreciation for the underlying physics behind their formation. So let's go a little in depth and answer the question on how these are made. And this all begins in the material. The Lichtenberg figures are captured in acrylic, as you can see here, and acrylic is a very strong insulator. This means that the material does not conduct electricity, which you'll see is almost a necessity to create these figures. So then, again, how do we create these figures? Now that we have our material, acrylic, we must irradiate it. That's right, this whole process starts in a particle accelerator. Well. Not this type of particle accelerator, we're not doing this in the Large Hadron Collider or anything, but instead in a different type of particle accelerator called a Linear Accelerator, or LINAC. LINACs use electromagnetic fields to accelerate subatomic particles. In our case, those particles are electrons. These electrons produced by the LINAC are of very high energies. The energies of these electrons can be almost 20 MeV which is even higher than the energies of electrons found in beta radiation produced as a product of radioactive decay. So what can we do with a beam of very high energy electrons? Most people use this beam for things like sterilizing medical equipment, sterilizing food, cancer treatment, things like that. But we put our acrylic under it. So let's take a close look here at what exactly happens in the LINAC when we put our acrylic under this beam of electrons. So here's a piece of acrylic, and first of all, I want you to imagine that Lichtenberg figure isn't there, and I'm going to lay this down flat on the table here. This is exactly the same orientation that the acrylic would be in the particle accelerator. It would be laying flat, and we would have a beam of electrons coming down orthogonal to the surface of the acrylic. Now, let's imagine this a little more schematically. You can see I have my beam of electrons here and my acrylic here, just like we illustrated on the countertop. Now, I'm going to turn this electron beam on, and you're going to see those electrons progress down to the acrylic. Now, when the electrons come into contact with the acrylic, they actually pass through, as you can see here, despite the acrylic being an insulator. This is because the penetration of the electrons is not necessarily dependent on the electrical conductivity of the material, but more so dependent on the kinetic energy of the electrons, which are able to effectively rip straight through the acrylic until they lose all their kinetic energy and they come to a stop at the same location. As the electrons travel through the acrylic, they induce a special type of defect within the atomic structure of the acrylic. These defects are called color centers. Color centers are essentially defects that induce a change in the electronic structure of a material. So, in other words, the radiation damage induced by the electron beam changes the color of the acrylic. You can actually see this slight change of color in the video that's playing on loop. These acrylic blocks are slightly green, and that is the result of the color centers. So let's get back to the model. So, as the electrons penetrate through the acrylic, they're losing energy. And once an electron loses all of its energy, it's going to come to a stop. 
And because all of these electrons have roughly the same energy, they're all going to come to a stop in roughly the same position. Now, once these electrons come to a stop, there's not really anywhere for them to go because now the insulative properties of the acrylic are relevant. So once an electron comes to rest within the acrylic, it essentially just stays there. So we have electrons pretty much sticking around in one layer within the acrylic, and we have our electron beam depositing more and more electrons. So these electrons build up and up and accumulate and accumulate in the same region, essentially creating a massive negative charge within the acrylic. We call this a space charge. A visualization of this space charge is seen in the schematic now, and you may be wondering why the edges of the space charge are rounded. The general consensus for this is that within the linear accelerator during irradiation, electrons along the edges can actually bleed out, as we can see here in this animation. This results in an uneven accumulation of charge, and thus a space charge that's not perfectly rectangular. Now, as we all know in electromagnetism, opposites attract. And when we have a very negatively charged object, it's bound to attract positive charges. Luckily for the acrylic, within the linac during irradiation, many positively charged species are evolved. These species are highly attracted to the negatively charged acrylic, and they impart their positive charge onto the surface of the acrylic. This process is repeated many times over among many different species within the accelerator and thus the acrylic gains a significant positive charge on the surface. Again, with the acrylic being a very good electrical insulator, this accumulated positive charge doesn't really have anywhere to go. And so we get two distinct regions of charge within our material, an interior negatively charged space charge and an exterior positively charged surface. At this point, trillions and trillions of electrons have accumulated within the acrylic. This is effectively creating a massive electric field. In response to massive electric fields like these, insulators can actually undergo a process known as dielectric breakdown when they suddenly, temporarily become conductive. This same process occurs in air when real lightning strikes. Now, in our acrylic, however, we can initiate this process by introducing a small defect. When we compress the material, that locally increases the electric field just enough to initiate that dielectric breakdown process. This is illustrated in our schematic by this falling black arrow. And as that material is compressed and dielectric breakdown is initiated, the majority of electrons discharge on the order of nanoseconds. Which neutralizes the positive surface charge. During this process, the acrylic is ionized into a white hot plasma. And this plasma is localized to the areas in which the electrons traveled. This creates the Lichtenberg channels that we know and love which are essentially the paths the electrons took during discharge. Now I want you to notice two things. One is that we can see that there is still a small amount of charge that remains. This charge is the reason behind the secondary discharges that we see after the first primary discharge. You can see these secondary discharges playing in the video in the top right. And these secondary discharges can last on the order of minutes. The other thing that I want you to notice is that the Lichtenberg pattern does not go all the way to the edges of the acrylic. This is the product of the oddly shaped space charge that I talked about. The curved edges of the space charge resulted in insufficient charge for the dielectric breakdown process to propagate all the way to the edges of the acrylic. Thus, we see no pattern there. Related to this is that the Lichtenberg pattern only exists approximately on a 2D plane within the acrylic. This gives us a good illustration as to where the space charge existed within the acrylic. Also within this image, we can see two distinct regions of color, a pale yellow region and a clear region. This pale yellow region is the region that was green prior. After some time, the color center defects actually anneal themselves, and the green color is lost. However, some residual radiation damage still exists, resulting in this pale yellow color where the electrons penetrated. Now, these Lichtenberg figures don't always turn out perfect. Let's imagine we gave our acrylic too large of a dose and the space charge was too big. If this occurs, when we go to initiate dielectric breakdown, the process is so violent that the acrylic blows itself apart. Alternatively, if we don't create a strong enough space charge, when we initiate dielectric breakdown in this case, hardly anything will happen and we'll be left with a very puny Lichtenberg figure or possibly nothing at all. So that pretty much wraps up 
the physics behind the creation of these Lichtenberg figures. Now, again, I must say that this process is still under active research, and thus new hypotheses on the formation of Lichtenberg figures and dielectric breakdown in acrylic are always being created. And so in this explanation video, I stuck to a generally well-accepted sort of standard model of the process. Current research shows that this process is far more nuanced than what I explained in this video. And if you would like to learn more about these nuances, I could point you to some more interesting papers. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.